Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Face the Music and The Living End and their keynote address. Um, just before we get into it, I just wanted to let you know we're not going to have question and answers at the end, but during the, the um, interview process, if anybody has any questions, just stick your hand up and we'll answer them for you. And um, that fella over there, Max, has got a mic. So it's Sean. And Sean. So we'll get straight into it, and I'm going to start with a, a question. Um, which Living End song are you most proud of, and why? Us. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a question for you. Hi, Asha. Um, did you just say the, the King Overdressed? No, I said Keynote Address. Okay, good. <laughs> <clears throat> um, well, I would say my favourite song it's a favourite song or a, a really of. important song I think for us was a song called Second Solution because I think it was probably one of the first times I remember hearing something back whether it was in the studio or maybe it was even a rehearsal room recording at that point I'm not sure but I sort of felt like oh, we, we, we have an identity now like we sounded like us we didn't just sound like you know we were trying to mimic another band it had like a kind of identity and it had a whole, there was a whole package. I could, I could kind of see like that, that we had a future beyond that point because it had all the elements of everything that we've been trying to kind of put together in a song for the first time. And it was like, the, the sort of scene that we came from was very like, you know, it was like this full on kind of rockabilly scene where it was like you either, you either wrote really melodic songs or you just played 12 bar blues. But we always wanted to try and do both. And for me, that was the first time that it sort of came together and I felt like we actually had found our own sound. Anyone? And um, Ray and Andy, I think you guys have probably got a different view on that. Oh, not a different view. I think that, that song's still incredibly relevant and we play it every single show because, as Scott pointed out, over a very nice lunch, uh, it's still a really fun song to play, which, which holds a lot of weight. But... Um, I would I would say wake up from the the record state of emergency because that was the the, the time when the the internet sort of exploded and and MySpace at the time was was just sort of showing its. It was the first time we we connected to fans online. Yeah, and, and I must say, band again. Ray had a lot to do with setting that record up and and to be ready to jump on that sort of. Um, internet uh, train phenomenon, yeah, had a lot to do with that record being successful and, and I think that song was the one that connected with a whole new generation of fans and, and we're lucky enough, I think, to, to still have 90% of those guys still with us today. And uh, I guess while we're on the songwriting tip and this is probably a question for each of you to answer individually, um, which song that somebody else wrote um, do you wish you wrote and why, Scotty? I'd say one of pretty much any of the early oil songs, but something like, I don't know, The Power and the Passion or Stand in Line or one of those kind of tunes. Because the oils were the first band that when I was in high, primary school, high school, the first band that I sort of started getting into. And... Um, loving and thinking, l watching the bass player and going, hey, that looks like a pretty cool job. Um, and also just, you know, the, they were the first band that I ever saw play live on stage as well and I remember it being a rather pow powerful experience, seeing a big Muppet up the front with a bald head and a microphone. Um, and, you know, guy in pink overalls smashing the drums real good too. Um, a couple of pretty half-decent guitar players and uh, and then the guy at the back, which is what I sort of thought, yeah, maybe I could sort of fit into that spot. That'd be cool. So what did I do? Went and got a massive, enormous double bass and <laughs> stood on top of it and, yeah, not exactly at the back. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but also, like now, you know, after having grown up a little bit since those days, um, understanding, you know, what Garrett's message was and what the, what Rotzi and Magini's sort of vision as musicians and f coming from a sort of semi-punk rock scene back in Sydney, back in the 70s and 
being able to take their music to the world. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the oils, I suppose. One of those songs. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Um, uh, for me, it'd be uh, Be My Baby by the Ronettes, just because it sounds like youth and it never gets old. And uh, it's three minutes of taking me to a, an amazing place where I don't get a hangover, I suppose. It's like, the, it's like a, just a natural high. And uh, I don't know, to be able to write a song that's that timeless and that kind of um, amazing is just uh, beyond me. But yeah, it just sounds like youth in three minutes. There you go, Andy. I could choose a hundred, but... I would say um, Queens of the Stone Age, no one knows because when we were doing the big day out in 2003, we, the three of us were lucky enough to obviously watch them every day, but the first show was in New Zealand and they blew up the main stage PA, I think. Something like that, right? Yes. About two songs in and they went, oh, well, sorry. Um, and we were very disappointed. Anyway, later in the day it was announced that they'd probably play this side stage which was a few kilometres up the hill and we thought, oh, we've got to stay. So we stayed, we watched them walk onto this, like, it was the triple R stage equivalent in New Zealand, wherever that is, and um, we just saw them basically blow people's, or they blew our minds, right? And um, that song just encapsulates, I think, everything that we do or love or get off on in regards to music. It's so powerful, so tight, it's got tricky stuff, it's got simplicity. It's got heaps of hooks and um, just seeing them play on that tour I think brought us to a, a whole new level in terms of what we wanted to get out of a gig and um, we, we sort of took on board their amount of energy and their approach, I suppose. And um, Big time. Yeah, very amazing. So being Melbourne Music Week and with The Living End being a Melbourne band, I think it's important to, I guess, discuss the idea of how much this city has influenced you guys as to the band that you are and to give everybody a bit of background as to how and why that's happened? Well, yeah, it gave us heaps of exposure to gigs and, and different kinds of bands and subcultures of bands as well. Granted, we can't, we've started our life, Chris and I, as a band, as, as musicians playing bloody rockabilly music which was a subculture, is a subculture. It's um, a thing of the past. It's a retro thing. And um, so we, you know, started off playing gigs with other rockabilly bands and stuff like that. And there was a scene for that, which is cool, which is a great thing about Melbourne. It happens in other cities too, but, you know, we live here. Um, and th but then, you know, as Chris was saying, talking about that song, Second Solution, that we did become exposed to other different kinds of music and I think that's one of the lovely things about Melbourne is that there is a bunch of different subcultures that all survive, have their own existence, ha well, had venues to play at and all had their own sort of scene going on. And I, fi I find, found, that in Melbourne all scenes were sort of open to each other and welcoming of, of the other styles of music and they all sort of bound together. And I think that shaped the way we sort of evolved musically from just being a rockabilly band playing music that our mums and dads liked to also playing music that, you know, punk rock music, ska music, jazz scenes, blues scenes, all rock and roll scenes, thrash sort of scenes, you know, we would play rockabilly music at some hot rod dancing sort of weirdo thing out in Castle, Maine on Friday night or whatever where the, the audience would be full of people who look like they were from 1955 and then support some band called the fucking Fuck Fucks or something at the um, <laughs> tote on Friday night. And it was, a, it was a nice diverse life for us and I thank Melbourne for that sort of diversity. Um, yeah, anything to say, Chesnez? No, no, no. I just think it was, it's a very, it was a very fierce, and maybe it, it probably is now, it was a very fierce kind of scene. Like, there was a lot of really great bands. And we were trying to sort of, getting on lots of diverse bills. 
and we had to sort of fit in. And as Scott said, we would play like someone's 21st birthday or a wedding or something. We were sort of doing covers and just starting to write our own tunes. And then we had to play with some like death metal thrash group the next night. And we had to kind of cut it and had to fit in and, and try and win over their crowd. That was our thing. We had to try and every audience we played in front of, we had to get them by the end of the half hour set or whatever it was. So you learn to kind of diversify and particularly in Melbourne at that point, it's just such an amazing band scene and, and we just learned to kind of, I don't know, play tough, I suppose, to not get laughed at, I guess, <laughs> at that point um, and try and sort of fit in. So I think um, this band couldn't have really come from anywhere else. The, the amount of influences we have that we've put into the melting pot is because of this city. Andy, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, well, all those things are very relevant, but I, I moved here 21 years ago from Adelaide I lived on a farm in Adelaide and there wasn't really a scene on the farm. I used to play to the cows a lot. Um, that was about it for me. So I had this wacky idea that um, after seeing the Hooter Gurus play uh, a song, uh, a show, sorry, at the Thevenin Theatre in Adelaide and I got Mark Kingsmill's drumstick, I went, that's it. I'm quitting every other idea that I've got. I'm moving to Melbourne, which was a hell of a long way away from my... Uh, upbringing um, to be a part of this scene you know and I haven't left and I love the place and you know I think yeah Melbourne's responsible for some pretty amazing music. Um, the next question Ray is one for you um, because your memory is so much better than the boys but um, I you know one thing a lot of people may or may not know is the debut Living End album um, was the highest selling Australian debut or highest selling debut album in Australian music history for a very long time and from the roots of being a covers band that you were just speaking about and all kind of growing up together with you as the manager, can you kind of express how it felt to then go through the bidding war and all how quickly all of that happened? <laughs> <laughs> that seems like so long ago now. Um, when I first saw the band, it was with Green Day, I think, and I can still remember thinking, who the fuck are these guys and why the fuck did they get the Green Day support? I went to that show hating that band. I didn't even care if they were good or not. I just hated them because I didn't know who they were and didn't think they deserved it. I did tell you guys that, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, we were completely unknown. And then the next time I saw them, still hates the band. Later, they were playing at one o'clock in the afternoon at the Falls Festival. It was December 96, or I guess January 97, whichever way you want to look at it. And I can remember standing there with my boyfriend at the time and it was one o'clock in the afternoon, there was about 200 people watching them and nobody cared and I was just besotted. And the reason I was besotted was because I was watching them put on the most amazing live show for no one that I'd ever seen a band do and I just knew I had to work with them from that day. And then I guess Prisoner was obviously what made it all happen. The song that was written to go on a tour, hope, hopefully selling 500 copies to go on tour with Body Jar so he could sell something. Yeah, that Pay for petrol. <laughs> um, but the explosion, fuck, I don't know, that was just the most intense thing ever. I think there was 13 major labels at the time from the States that were calling me every day, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, it didn't matter, people were flying over from overseas. Um, Tom Wally, the head of, what was it, Interscope at the time, got on a plane and went to a show in Tasmania where the floor collapsed. Was that the one where the floor that collapsed? Was with yep. Jebediah on the tour? Yeah. That was floor, intense. The floor got broken. And then a lot of it was trying to keep that undercover and, and not be that band. I remember Spider what they had a bit of a thing going at the time and a lot of media writing about them going on a major label. But for us, it was about keeping it really on the down low and trying to keep everything grounded. That was the big challenge, trying to keep everything grounded so the band stayed real. And how did you know, like, had, did you have a mentor or anybody that you were asking advice from? How did no, you know we were, how to I manage were, that I process? I the whole time, I winged it. But yeah. I, I, having said that, and this is a really good piece of advice, I was never afraid to ask questions if there was something I didn't know, because I was a new manager, I didn't really know what I was doing, so I didn't mind picking up the phone and going, hey, I've got no fucking idea what this is about, please help me. And I don't think there's any shame in doing that because you, you've got a responsibility as a manager to do the right thing by the artist at all times. And if that means swallowing your pride to make sure that you're doing the right thing, then that's really important. I was never afraid of doing that. My memory of that time is around the time when alternative ma music kind of met the mainstream, you know, both in the US and Australia. And there was a real call from a lot of bands f for the being a sellout. 
And how did you guys feel as a band with your peers at the time? That's why we kept everything so underground. Yeah. We didn't talk about it a lot. We, we really tried to keep it really quiet, just how much interest there was. We could have made a big media thing out of it, but we kept it really down low. Do you remember getting any accusations from other bands in your scene for being sellouts or getting that feeling, you know, that you were almost feeling guilty for your success? No. Uh, maybe a little bit from sort of a kind of... You know, Scott was saying the rockabilly scene that we came from, but we're talking about like three or four hundred people on a Sunday afternoon at the Royal Derby, and for us it was a big deal at that point because that was the only people that came to see the band. So I think when we started writing our own tunes and we started throwing in a few major seventh and diminished chords, it was a bit like, hang on, that's not in the rule book, you can't do that. And especially when we, we became a bit more successful, there was probably a little bit of a backlash, but I sort of feel like Scott and I had been on the same mission since we first, you know, we were riding our skateboards and playing guitar at the same time. Not at the same time, because that'd, be, that'd be really talented, but probably dangerous. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> um, we never wanted to be, you know, like, um, like the typical A50s kind of band. We always, we never hid at the fact that we loved um, the Beatles and we loved Strawberry Fields Forever and we loved the Bee Gees and you know a lot of English kind of punk stuff which was a lot more melodic so I think when when people sort of started to have a go at us about changing it just didn't really it wasn't warranted because we'd always wanted to be a successful band and we always tried to get more people to the shows and that kind of reminds me of something when we had our very first meeting in Thornbury, actually, about me managing you guys, and you said, well, why do you want to manage us? We're just a rockabilly band. And I can remember saying to you at the time, you're not just a rockabilly band. I fucking hate rockabilly. <laughs> the fact that I like you so much means you're more than that. And you were. Yeah, I never, we never saw it as a bad thing to be successful, basically. You know, it was like, we want to be musicians. We want to, to be able to make a living from it. It's probably not going to happen. To be successful, it's probably not going to happen, but we're going to give it a red-hot go. So, and I don't think we compromised, we just, we just did what we did and just tried to be the best that we could at it and Triple M was never going to play a band like us, but, you know, the rest is history, isn't it? It is. Well, I guess, you know, one thing I've thought, there's a, there's a couple of bands um, that I've always thought, like, the, the, your live performance consistency has always been right up there with the very best live bands in the world and I know that you're still striving to get better and I just wanted to kind of touch on that and how that dynamic works internally, like how you approach each show and, you know, and keep that focus on being better every time you play live? Well, we approach it like it's our last show. It's such a cliche, but, it, but it, and, and as I said earlier, it's just fear of being a forklift driver. I just, just don't, can't do anything else. You'd be pretty good on the forklift. <laughs> do you reckon? You reckon? Yeah, Reversing might be it. a little tricky, but I'd be <laughs> going going forward. <laughs> or is that backward in a forklift? <laughs> Oh. Uh, Ray, as a manager, what would you say was, I don't know whether it's the biggest or steepest learning curve you <coughs> faced? I'm sorry, what was that? The biggest learning curve or the biggest mistake and what did you learn from it as a manager? Um, I don't, oh, this is going to sound terrible, but I don't actually think I've made a lot of critical mistakes and that harks back to something that I said before. I've never been ashamed to learn or ask a question. Even even with 20 years experience now, if there's something I don't know, I'll ring someone and ask and find out. So yeah, I don't, I can't really say that there's been a massive mistake that I've learned from. Not that I'm perfect, but... Like a learning curve, something you didn't expect, so you kind of had to learn and grow from. She does that all the time. You're always picking up, that's the thing with the internet and so forth. Yeah. She's not afraid to give everything a go, yeah. yeah. And I think... And, and listen to this a lot. I listen to the gut a lot. I mean, we've made decisions based on my gut instinct before, haven't we? Yep. Yeah, there was and always a bit of a thing. Remember, you used to... Whenever we'd have a long discussion about a decision that we need to make, Ray always had a pretty awesome um, sort of technique or whatever of going, right, I've got to... Everyone's got to say what their head feels, their heart feels and their gut feels, and then she'd write them all down and do your, I don't know, weirdo maths or whatever on it. <laughs> And they probably, she's probably just ended up going, oh, okay, so it all boils down to whatever you thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I can remember Andy does this a lot. He'll, 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 he'll often say, what does your gut tell you to do? And, I've, and I'll tell him, and then he'll be like, well, then, then we'll go with that. And it's usually been the right decision. 
Airy fairy answer, huh? Sorry. Um, just back to the live thing, I just wanted to touch on that one more. Like, just before you guys go on stage for a gig, big or small, is there is there a process that you go through? Yes. The yes. Three of you. Vodka. It takes. It. Yeah. We still, get, we, still get, we still get really nervous, the three of us, and we deal with it in our own ways. But um, vodka. Vodka. Yeah. It's definitely I, a clearance I, of the band room for fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Can get, into get everyone out, and then we, you know, paste. The wall, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But I, I take every show... I, I just don't want to let these guys down and Ray and our front of house guy and our crew. It's like a... It's, it's a footy game and you don't want to let your mates down and you go out there and my job is to make his job easy and his job easy because that's, that's my job in the band, you know? And um, when we're all on fire, it, it's so easy, but... It's, it's like a footy game. You go out there and we've, all, we've, we've each got our position on the field and what, whatever that might be. Everyone's important, from the, the front of house guy to the, the drum tech and the guitar tech, and everyone's involved and you don't want to let anyone down. Pretty weird way to look at it, a rock and roll gig, but yeah. it's pretty intense. Like, when we go out, we don't go out to, you know, we don't take it lightly. We, we take every gig. Um, we don't want to like, you know, if we're playing tonight, we want to make everyone in the room happy and, and walk away saying that was the best gig I've ever seen. Yeah, but I remember like that, that's all we had initially, like any band has, you know, you don't know whether you're going to go and make records or get on the radio. So you try and just be the best live band you, you could be. And for, uh, for us, it was like, we came from a scene where it was all about the live energy and about blowing the roof off the joint. That's what all of our sort of favourite bands did. And even in Australia, like the, the level of, of live bands here is out of control, whether it's the Oils or ACDC. I mean, that kind of heritage, you look back on those videos and you just go, oh my God, you know, we'll never be that good. And we were just hungry to always not have anybody walk out of a venue, whether it was 50 people at the corner back bar, if we were lucky. Um, through the big day out gigs, you just gotta, you gotta turn everyone on. And, and that's just, that was always our mission. So I think if we, if we don't make any more records or ever get on the radio again, hopefully we'll, always be a great live band because that's that was just everything to us so it's it's just it's just important for no one to walk away and go well they used to be good and it's also the influences that we had as well you know coming from that rockabilly background where bands like the stray cats and all those english sort of neo rockabilly bands from the 80s and early 90s or whatever they all they were like cartoon characters, you know, and that's what appealed, that is what also appealed to us about those bands as well as their music was the fact that they were larger than life when they were on stage and they really sort of put on a, put on a, put on a good old show. When you guys first started playing, like coming off the back of such a, a deeply entrenched pub rock scene that we have in Australia and playing to really tough audiences, like tough demanding audiences. You guys were kids, like pretty much teenagers, going up and playing in front of some pretty mean-spirited audiences. Do you have any memories of that where you were terrified or any experiences that you want to share there? Yeah, it was pretty intimidating, those first few gigs that we would do, that we did, like first few pub gigs that we did when we were still bloody teenagers. Our mums and dads were frigging driving us there, which was a bit embarrassing. It's like, drop us off, help us lug our shit in, and then please stand at the back of the room. Don't talk to anyone. <laughs> um, and we were playing, you know, with bands like Hacksaw at the um, <laughs> Richmond Club Hotel on a friggin' Wednesday night. Hacksaw, um, a metal band from where? The, the eastern suburbs? They had their own van with Hacksaw written on the side of it, so they were professional. <laughs> and they had guitars shaped like Hacksaws. But they had a bit of a boat, a bit of a sort of metal crowd, and we'd get up and yeah, with our you know tinky, sorry Chris, <laughs> tinky little sort of non-distorted guitar, and our drummer who stood up and only used three bloody drums. So how is he going to go double kick? And he's only got three drums, <laughs> and a friggin' upright bass from a bloody orchestra or something. And here we were playing to a bunch of pissed-up metalheads. So our theory was like, okay, we, we can do this. What, like, what have we got against this? Nothing. We can, we can smash it out and play our songs hard and fast and these guys will see the... They'll, they, they'll feel the energy in it and they'll, they'll get the vibe and 
Yeah, we seem to manage to pull it off most of the time, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I was going to say, um, it can't be underestimated the importance of, of this man right here, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wally Meany. <laughs> who, uh, who, I might add, was one of the first to, to start giving us gigs. And I remember Wally calling home one night saying you could get us a gig with the Painters and Dockers at the uh, SB Front Bar. Which was a, we'd never played the SB. We'd only played maybe the Richmond Club in the corner at that point. And that was a really monumental moment for us. I remember getting off the phone and ringing you straight away and going, we've got a gig at the SB front bar. It was a really big deal at that point. But it was, it was so frightening. And I think we always kind of went into those shows and played play those kinds of gigs like, yeah, like, we were like rabbits in the headlights at that point because we just, we didn't know what we were doing. But we also wanted to just, <clears throat> you know, really make an impression, and it was. And I think we're s there's still a part of that that's there now. We n we've never been overconfident. We've always been a bit like, shit. I don't know if we can do this. I don't know if we can pull this off. Which I don't know whether I'd recommend that to bands starting out now, but it, it seems to work for us because it means we just go out like 200% and feel like we have something to prove still to this day. We've got a question over here. Um, hey, um, I guess because you mentioned uh, what, like the spark and the sort of excitement you guys got and with the metalheads. Um, how, my question is, these days, after you've been together for so long, what still excites you about music and how do you, particularly when you go to write, how do you guys like, yeah, keep just keep the energy and like, you know, keep churning out like 10 song albums and stuff like that? What keeps you going? Um, just, do you? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I guess it's just, just the passion and, and just the pure excitement of, of hearing a song and, and getting a rush from it. And it's a very difficult thing to put into words, you know, but we're all here for the same reason because it, it's just, like I said earlier, it like takes you to just to a higher place and and I still get that when I hear like a song on the radio or see a live footage of a band or something it's like you're 15 again and it just is this incredible feeling it's difficult to put into words and it, all it does even if I see like a magazine cover with like a really cool photo of Angus Young or something I just go fuck I want to go home and write a song or I want to go home and practice my guitar and I remember being like that when I was like nine years old you know so I'm probably just really it's an immaturity thing, perhaps. I just haven't quite grown up, but I still get, I still get that kind of, that warm feeling inside from that, and and I just feel like we've got a lot to to prove, you know, on our live gigs and as far as writing songs, it's just endless. You know, there's just so many things to to uncover still, and so for me, it's it's just that buzz of seeing other people doing it, and and it never gets tired. One thing that's always been really clear to me about your band is the patience and the time that you put into your fans. And I was just wondering, is that something that you guys, the four of you collectively, have a, an ethos on, on how you approach that, or is it something that just is unspoken and you just do it? It's R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Aretha. I was hoping you were going to have a little sing for us as well. I'd say you're raised. <laughs> it's how you're raised, isn't it? way to pay good money to see a show you want to give them a good show you don't want security treating them like shit and it's that probably that punk rock ethos as well oh, it's just nothing worse than a rock star is there yeah. is there Asho? i just don't you know we've never been the kind of i think it's how we were raised as people we just treat others how you want to be treated and um yeah respect as ray said and i just never bought into that whole kind of Someone, yeah, yeah, someone who's sold a lot of records or, or plays with a lot of people thinking that they're <coughs> a higher species of human being than someone else. I just don't get it. Plain and simple, Andy. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. And without, you know, without the fans, we wouldn't be able to buy our speedboats and our, you know. <laughs> <coughs> There's that side of it as well. Um, it's very, I'm sure it's already become very obvious to you guys um, that the four of you are like family, like brothers and sister. Um, I know that three of you have kind of been working together for about 20 years and Andy's been in the band for 14. 
and um, he's I, still the new guy. The, yeah, yeah still, <laughs> still the new guy. guy. And I and yeah, I guess want to touch on that and how much that's kind of influenced your longevity as a gang or a family, right? I guess from a management perspective, it's really easy. It's kind of like. I know how everybody thinks so much now that you don't even, don't even have to have conversations anymore. Like if something will come through and I'll know straight away whether or not that fits or not. And it'll be more a case of me sending an email a bit later going, hey, I said no to this, just so you know, and there's never an issue with it because we all, we're all on the same page. It's women's intuition, girlfriend. Oh, OK, <laughs> apparently it's that too. <laughs> not uh, just you know what, though? Long. You know what, though, for me, for, for as, as good as Ray is at working things out and getting things logistically happening and, and, and the marketing and publicity and all that sort of stuff. At the end of the day, if she doesn't like a song, she says it, you know, and it's not, it's not like, oh, God, I hate that song, but it would be a big hit. She's like, honest. no, that's, that's, I, I'm not into that song. So the fact that we have a manager who is <coughs> as diligent and as successful as she is, but is still all about the song is very, very important because without that, you've got, you really have got nothing. So... She's always look at, listening out for that hook and just that, as I said before, just that feeling of, yeah, that's, that's the right tune. You know, and that's really important to have. It doesn't matter how much you can do the figures and the sums and stuff. You need, we, we want a manager who's into what we do and gets a rush from, from the music. We got a question over here. Yeah, great. I was just wondering, um, on a like, percentage of how many songs are you guys uh, develop just by jamming, just by improvisation and just playing together and how many songs, say for example Chris, you kind of just bash out on a guitar and go, I've got these ideas, how do you think we string them together? Like inspiration together in a rehearsal room versus you bringing something prepared, like what's the success rate? <sighs> God, I don't know, I like... It's a hard one, but 80-20? Yeah, hey? I don't know. It they come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? Sometimes you bring songs in that are complete. Is that on? Hi. Can you interview me? They come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes Chris will spend almost years working on a song before it comes into the rehearsal room and it's already got, what, how many choruses would you say, Andy? What's the record? Be nice. That's about the average of choruses per song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like different choruses, I'm saying. Yeah. But then sometimes Chris will come into the rehearsal room with nothing but a guitar lick or something or whatever, you know, something, and that can turn into a song instantly. And everywhere in between, basically. And then there has been songs that have been born just of a jam as well. But to answer your question directly, I'd say the majority of them are sort of baked up in the oven for quite some time in your like little home studio oven cooking away for quite some time before they're presented to the band. <laughs> yeah, try and take stuff in that I think is already kind of good. It's not like, oh look, I just came up with this riff this morning and you know, I don't know if it's any good or not and let's just jam on it. We don't, we're not really that kind of band. It's more of just kind of me having a fairly good idea of what, what direction I think it could go in. And then what, you know, we might, we're big fans of kind of, we get like a, a verse or something and we go, let's try it in like a funk, which never works. It's always fun, um, never works. <clears throat> What's that? Always fun, never works. Always fun, never works. Um, you know, and then we just, and, but, and, and a lot of the time, not a lot of the time, but sometimes we'll exhaust an idea of a song and then we get rid of it. And, but yeah, we sort of, we, we're not a real jam kind of band. We like to have a, an idea first. There's another question. He needs a microphone. Oh, my God, my throat's fucked. Um, so the, I guess for me, the one thing that I've been noticing a lot lately is there's a lot of bands in the last 10 years that are breaking up after their first and second records. And at the same time, I'm noticing bands like The Living End and their peers doing their 20th and 25th anniversary <coughs> tours. And I guess this is probably one for you, Ray, in about how you guys collectively manage the ups and downs, because I know there's been plenty of downs as well. It's not all rosy to still be sitting here after this many years and to be still motivated moving forward. Yeah, I can distinctly remember Modern Artillery, the third album for the band, being a real low point as far as the industry was concerned because they'd come off such big albums before that. And by um, 
Having said that, it still sold 50,000 copies, but by living in standards, that was a, an unsuccessful record. But that Because they were a great live band, we were still able to go out and do a really great pub tour to 800,000 people a night, and we played a ton of those. And I, I'm, one of my best memories from that period was somebody from EMI, while the band were getting interviewed, was standing across the road from me, saying, and he said to me, I, still can't, I can't believe people still care enough to want to interview this band. You can imagine what that did to me. That just made me really want to go, you know what, fuck you. Wait until the next album, um, person. <laughs> <laughs> you know what almost came out of my mouth then, don't you? <laughs> and we did, and we it's showed true. them. <laughs> But the fact that they were a good live band made it really easy because the, and they'd had a, a string of radio hits as well. And even even now sometimes there's there's those people that are like, oh, I'm living in India, whatever. And then they'll go to a festival, they'll see them, and they'll realise that they can sing the words to ten of the songs without even realising that they know the words because they've had so much radio play and they've had such a legacy of, of hit songs that a, a living in show is great whether you're a fan or not because they're so entertaining. So I'm not sure how many of you know, but album number seven is just um, starting to percolate. And just before we get into the details of that, there's obviously been a bit of time between number six and number seven, and um, I was wondering if each of you could just touch on what you've been doing musically <coughs> outside of the Living In in that time. Andy? <laughs> um, not much. I don't like sitting around and getting too bored, so I just had a bunch of tunes that I decided to go and record with... Um, one of our family members, Woody, who does our front of house, and um, we're actually recording a record with him right now. Um, so I had this little project called The Pants Collective because someone that I played in a band with many years ago called me Pants, Andy Pants. I thought, oh, what a cool name, Pants Collective, there you go. So I've just done a little EP, and um, it's kind of cool just to challenge, well, for me it's a, it's a challenge because I'm... I guess writing songs but also trying to learn how to play guitar, bass, drums and doing it all and singing which is just not really my forte but um, yeah it's kind of fun but onwards and upwards we move on to album number seven. Phil Collins. Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do car. You don't know. do what? <laughs> Cocaine. Don't you? No. Why don't you tell everyone about it? Well, I... <laughs> I <didn't know. laughs> Sorry, Phil. Christopher? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just kind of, you know, learning how to waste time. Um, You've been doing loads. Yeah, I've been doing loads. <clears throat> I'm trying to... Yeah, it's sort of working on a solo record that's going to come out at some point. Um, uh, playing guitar in a couple of different... Things, um, I don't know, just kind of playing in an all star band. Playing in an all is that what you it's need called? Me to tell you what you've been yeah, please do. I can't, I can't be bothered, but manage magic. Now, you're about to go on a theater tour, yeah, theater tour. Got locked in this morning, did it? Yeah. Good, stand up. The idea, Chris, how good will it be? You tell, tell all these people about it, yeah, sorry. I'm so, kind of <laughs> no, we're just you know, um, living overseas now is kind of cool because there's different opportunities and um. Than, than sort of there is here, but, um, you know, it's sort of like, we didn't know whether we were going to make another record um, after the last one, but then we did, you know, the few shows that we've done, like Soundwave and a few of the others that we did. The Euro like, Tour, that was the one. Yeah, that. we did a tour of Europe, and it's like, we're crazy if we don't do another record, because we, it doesn't feel tired, it doesn't feel like we've... Um, Spent our load, is that one way of saying it? It's probably the wrong way of saying it, but uh, there's still plenty of fuel left in the tank. And so for me, I've got you know a few other projects on the go, but they're all kind of a little bit on the back burner at the moment because we want to focus on this and get this done. And um, I think it's healthy to, to do other things, but it just doesn't feel like the right time to kind of hang up our boots yet with this band. And Scotty, what have you been doing, mate? Um, yeah, as little as possible. But I've, I have, uh, I've, I moved up to Byron, which is, seems to me like the best place to do nothing. Um, but I ended up getting involved with uh, this thing where a friend of mine started writing lyrics. Like one, one day a friend of mine was over, our, both of our eight-year-old, seven-year-old sons at the time were sitting at the dinner table and I was about to dish up dinner and I, and I found myself saying to them, hey, boys, no guns or snakes at the dinner table, please. 
And my mate went, oh, that's a song. There's got to be a song in that. And so he wrote a song and he like, just wrote lyrics and emailed it to me and I put music to it and we went, hey, that's pretty good actually. Let's do this again. So we did it at about probably 50 or 60 times or whatever over the last 12 months. And I ended up going into a studio over the last few months and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> and, um, re and recording them myself, playing like Phil Collins style over here, um, playing all instruments. So it sounds awfully a amateur. But, um, and singing as well, which, whew, what a bloody job, Jesus. Uh, so, but I think, I'll, I think I'll probably put it out. Anyway, um, <laughs> aside, <laughs> aside from that most exciting venture, I, um, went, I became involved in a charity organisation. You know, I like to think of myself as a bit of a Brad Pitt style character. <laughs> and um, became involved in a charity organisation, went and built houses for homeless people, blah, 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 and go surfing a lot. We have a question over here. I, um, I'm a big fan of you guys. Um, I've heard a couple of your albums already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just want to know, how do you get that motivation? Like, um, man, like, think about, like, older bands, like... For instance, like, you know, um, you got Hoodoo Gurus and, um, and Jojo Zepp and the Falcons and all that. I mean, like, I don't know how I do it. Like, then you see a band and you see, like, they're playing, like, you know, and one of the guys is spreading the guitar and everything. Like, I don't know how I do it. Like, that motivation, they kick it in. I don't know how I do it, but yeah, I just want to know how I do it, so I can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Um, it's bands like that that motivate us, yeah. right? Yeah. It is. Uh, the Gurus for me were my childhood, um, you know, they were my idols and the Oils and the Stray Cats and all these bands that we sort of worshipped and, and look up to and they're the reason we do it. They're, the, they're our motivation, really. We want to be as good as they are or were. Yeah, it's exactly what you're saying, man. You, you see other bands doing it and you just go, how good is that? That looks like fun. I'm going to do that too. And you just keep doing it for fear of driving a forklift. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember um, like when we first started out look, seeing other bands and just going, man, like, we, we're never going to be that good. And doing like little recordings in Scott's garage and stuff and it just sounded so bad. You know, it just sounded horrendous. But... Um, it's just a matter of, you know, we just stuck at it and we, we just, it's just like this fear of kind of, fear of failure that you just kind of push yourself. There was never any point, I don't reckon, where we ever sat back and just thought we were the, the bee's knees. You know, we've always just had that hunger and that's, that's just a personality thing perhaps. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but we just, we are driven. You touched on it before, Chris, um, but I really want to delve a bit deeper into it about album number seven. Mm -hmm. And I know you've only just started, but it sounds like that you're approaching this in a very different way to what you've approached the first six albums. And I was um, hoping you could share a bit of that with everybody. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, well, you know, generally it's like a, what do we call it, right? It's like a three year cycle of where we, we do like six months of kind of writing and rehearsing and then then a few months of like pre-production and then you go in and you actually do the recording and then you go away on tour and then the whole thing sort of starts again. This time there hasn't really been any um, writing together as such. It's sort of been like we've all been off doing our own projects and we've just come together and done shows. Um, so we thought when we decided we would do this record, we just thought rather than even trying to write something together, we'll just go in and just press record and just throw ideas down and just see how it comes out, uh, trying to capture that kind of spontaneity and that energy of what we do on stage. And you just can't do that if it's over-rehearsed and overthought. So, you know, it might be the bloody biggest mistake of our career. <laughs> we don't really know at this point. But uh, we're just literally putting ideas down. I mean, I've got some songs that I've brought in and the other guys have got tunes as well. But we're not, but without the studio, we're not rehearsing also, it too much. We've also removed all the pressure. It's about just going in and having fun and making an, an album like a band, like just having fun. Yeah, there's we no have a... goals, there's no aspirations, there's no deadlines. There's four A4 
sheets of paper in the control okay. room that Ray wrote notes on. Drink more beer. The rules. Does it. Drink less beer. Drink less beer, drink more. Um, yeah, it's all about basically not overthinking and just keeping it really simple because I think nine times out of ten the initial idea is the strongest <laughs> one and you can chase your tail and change it and you end up coming back to the same thing anyway. So we're just trying to capture that initial vibe. Similar to what a live show would be. Yeah, a live show. Yeah. Well, with us, yeah, it's the, it's the, and probably with most bands, it's the accidents that happen that are kind of, you have to just, you have to keep your eyes and ears open at all times when you're kind of working on these tunes and we're, and we're waiting for those bits where someone plays the wrong note or the wrong chord because that, that's going to be the best bit of the song. And that just doesn't happen when it's like, this is how the song goes, you must play this beat and do not diversify from this beat. It's kind of boring. So we're literally throwing ourselves out into nowheresville hoping for the best so you know what could possibly go wrong and also trusting ourselves so we're not we're not essentially getting a big wig producer from america to come in and tell us how to play we're just going to play how's it feeling so far Terrible. feels good <laughs> <laughs> it's feeling great we did we did seven six or seven drum tracks i think something like that in in three days and that I don't know, we've, we, we've got like a whole bunch of sessions booked right up until Christmas, so... Well, that's the other part of it, got to keep it loose. It? We're keeping it simple in that, regard, in that regard as well. There's no drum tech and there's no like fancy drum kits and snare changes for every song and, you know, millions of guitar amps and all that sort of stuff. We're just keeping it very, very simple. And because um, at the end of the day, it's all about the tune. <laughs> if, if it's recorded in a bedroom or the most expensive studio in America, no one gives a shit as long as there's a, a tune, something you can sing. True? True. We have a question over here. Following on from what you just said there, Andy, with White Noise, it was mainly committed to tape, and that was a lot of that type of recording. And then that was, I believe, in the US, White Noise. And then State of Emergency was Byron, and then a little bit at Sing Sing. When you're doing, thinking about those type of things that aren't the songwriting, what do you think about when you go to make the sound of a record? What do you look for? in actual production values and things like that? Less and less, I think, <laughs> from my perspective anyway. But as I just said, I don't really... I mean, Chris's guitar is going to sound like Chris's guitar. Scott's got a double bass. They're amazing musicians. They, they sound like them, you know, and I hit drums. And, you know, I mean, it's like you can, you can listen to... Well, referencing that Queens of the Stone Age record before, the drum, t the drum sound to me isn't particularly wonderful. It doesn't sound like the most amazing drum kit in a big open room. It's all tight and kind of shitty sounding, but it's all about the song and the energy. And um, That's exa been the exact focus for this record, is taking all that pressure off. Yeah, not worrying about, is that snare drum right for this song? This is just from my perspective. Who gives a shit if <laughs> the snare drum doesn't sound right? It could be the best. It feels right. If it feels right, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, Chris sounds like Chris when he plays the guitar. There's no mistaking it. If he plays through a 15 watt thing that you got from the op shop or a blah, blah, blah. So, without wanting to call you guys old farts, I do want to talk about um, your legacy, um, firstly for the band and then secondly for Ray's management of the legacy. How, I guess, do you, in 20 years' time, hope that people perceive you as a band? How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> it's my job, man. In twenty, Was it 20 years' time or 30? 35. 35. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I mean, you're so... We're so kind of like... We're so, like, in the band. All three of us are in the band, all four of us. <laughs> we're really in it, you know? Um, so it's hard to know how people sort of perceive us now, you know, I mean, some people like us and some people think we suck and that's cool and it'll be the same in 20 years, right? Uh, I, I would like to think that <coughs> people think that, you know, we, we were unique and that we, we had something that not a, not a lot of other bands had or tried. I'd like to think that we, we went out on a limb every now and then, you know, we didn't we didn't play it safe, you know, we definitely haven't tried to reinvent music, but we haven't played it safe either. You know, we've, we've done everything from like three minute, three chord kind of punk rock Ramones tunes to writing an eight minute kind of 
tune with like strings and horns and stuff on it and we've tried to push ourselves and and that's only important if the music's good at the end of the day you know you can be experimental and be a pile of shit so hopefully people just look back and think that we had you know some great tunes and that we were a kick-ass live band and you know didn't play it safe i suppose i just want to be remembered as that guy who stands up on his big guitar <laughs> And you will, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Anything to add, Andy? Uh, <laughs> I can't really follow that, but I think um, I'd like to... Oh. Pardon? You are a bit. You're crying. <laughs> yeah, I li- uh, they've got a little bit of uh, okay. something in my eye. Got a bit of what in, y- <laughs> bit of what in your eye? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, fuck. Um, I'd like the band to be seen the way I see bands like the Gurus, I suppose. Um, Because they changed my life. They're the band that kind of made me want to play, like seriously want to play, you know. And um, watching them at places like Therapy Theatre, um, you know, it was like a religious experience or something, I don't know. And and it it really did change my life from being a massage therapist. I was just about to sign a lease on a a building. Still gives a great massage, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um... (laughs) So that was my that was my um, my my life. I was heading towards that. And I was just about to sign a lease on a little shop so I could be a massage therapist for the rest of my life. And then went and saw the gurus, you know, for for the tenth time. And it just blew my mind. It was like that was the most powerful. It was scary. It was it was exhilarating. It was amazing. And I was like, I want to be that guy, Mark Kingsmill, who I've never met. Because I'm too scared. I've met all the other guys, but I just can't. And he's just like a normal dude, but I can't. Like, I just can't talk to him. I'm so. Yeah. yeah. Give him a massage. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be cool to be remembered like a band like that. And Ray, what about you? And I guess your role in managing the legacy. I guess it's the irony, as long after the band have broken up, I'll still be managing them. You know, I'll still have things to do every day, whether it's an hour a day or an hour a week. There's things I'm still going to have to do and it's going to be still important to maintain contact with them and, and try and maintain the ethos and ethics of the band throughout whatever happens in the next 20 years and then the, the 50-year anniversary tour that I'll try and concoct and <laughs> God knows what else I'll be trying to do. But I guess mostly maintaining... I guess I want them to be remembered for their live performance and how hard-working they were and what good people they were. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There was somebody I'd spotted who had a question before and I've lost them. Sorry. Hey, um, with your, like, hugely successful career, like, how long it's been, is there anything in particular that you regret either doing or not doing? Oh, Red Rocks, that would be good, wouldn't it? How much longer have we got left? We've got time. <laughs> no. Uh, I, you know, no, I think, uh, you know, there's probably a few things, but it depends how you look at it. For, for me, I just think the career we've had has been above and beyond anything that we really expected. You know, Wally booking us at the SB front bar, as far as we were concerned at that point, we'd made it. Like, that was it. It was that simple, but it was. It was that simple, and it was... Then you release a CD, and then it was like, well, that's as good as it's ever going to get. So our dreams um, that Scott and I had when we were, you know, learning a few Everly Brothers tunes on our acoustic guitars at that point was so humble, you know, and so we've, we've gone further than we ever thought we'd go but you know to have done more internationally I suppose might have been nice but you know it's it ain't over yet so we'll we'll see what happens but we are really thankful and and grateful for everything that we've ever been given so pretty pretty lucky. Got another question up here. (coughs) Yeah, it was a pretty cool moment, actually, because I had a pretty average job 
at the um, council municipal office in Glen Waverley that I'd worked at for about three years or something, whilst also having other part-time jobs as well. While I was playing in the band, I was a busy individual. But the day I got to um, quit my job at the council was a bit of a monumental moment. When was it? I don't know. Was that when we... Was when it like would have been when our first record came no, out? And uh, it would have been after it came out because I remember yeah. having to lend the band the money to finish recording the first album because we didn't want to sign a deal too early. Yeah. And I had to get all the money from all the international tours that I'd done to fund it. I just remember going, well, going into work for three years and going, I'm not going to be here all my life, man. I'm gonna, my band's going to be famous. <laughs> Fuck you all. I'm getting out of this shit dump. And then <laughs> actually did. <laughs> I still don't know what my job was there. I, sm I think my job was smoking bongs in the basement and booking gigs for the band. I don't know why the council paid me to do that. <laughs> Sorry, there's always there's one in every band, dude. I've got nothing, I've, I um, I've we're got nothing almost to add. finished, so I just really. Okay, that Sorry, over last here. one. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people in bands and you know songwriters in the room. Like, what advice do you have for people that are, you know, wanting to pursue their music and try and get out there? You know, perseverance. Um, just don't take no for an answer, I guess. We, we were only saying before when we were at lunch that there was a few times in our career where we were like, you know, had people come in to see us play and there was one time in particular that we had a few record company people and stuff come to see us at the Annandale and we played the worst show and they, I think they just turned around halfway through and left and it was really disappointing for us. But, you know, we knew that we could... What we, what we did was good and we just kind of, we just stuck at it and, and the advice I give to songwriters is just kind of try not to mimic other people too much, try and find what it is that you like and, and really tap into the essence of that and, and to be diverse, you know, I mean, we were always one of those bands, I could, we could listen to Little Richard and then put on like OK Computer or something and get the same buzz out of it and we tried to sort of do it all and you, you sort of fall flat on your face half the time when you're trying to do too many things but you, you certainly find what your path is and that, that's the advice I'd give young bands is just to try and be true to yourself and that's, that's how you find your own voice. And uh, yeah, that self-belief is really important, that point that you brought up about that Annandale show, that's the same Annandale show where I had A&R um, people walk out and ring me the next day saying, oh, no, Ray, that all torn down song, that's terrible. They're just, they're never going to be anything more than a rockabilly band. I think you're wasting your time. And if I'd listened to that, and, they'd, and you'd listen to that, well, fuck, everything would be very different. But so that self-belief is incredibly important. And where are they now? <laughs> <laughs> Probably in here. Fall up. What is it? Fall over, stand up, fall over, stand up. Stuff like that. I've got one last question for you guys before we wrap it up and for all four of you really. Um, what are you most looking forward to with The Living End now? <laughs> Not the 50th anniversary tour. <laughs> 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 Get up on your base. I can't. excited about a new album because there was a lot there was, there was a period there where we didn't know if there was going to be one and just I, I've got a really strong feeling that this is the album that I've always wanted from them that I think is coming so I'm really excited about that. Yeah I can't really see past that at this point in time I don't think I ever have looked past <coughs> the next thing um, as long you know for as long as we've been around it's always just I don't know I don't have that long vision or long division in maths. Um, but to be able to see past what we're doing next, and you know, it's just focus all your energy on that, do the best job you can, and then there will be something to look forward to next. But you've got to concentrate on what you're doing now for there to be a, another one. So, yeah, I'm looking, really looking forward to this album. Um, it's been fun so far. We've actually digged through our cutting room floor, scraps, that we, sort of songs that we've left behind. And it's, it's been an unreal experience of digging those songs out from years ago and just sort of basically doing covers of our own songs and um and they sound fresh again they sound sort of new and exciting so 
yeah, that's what's exciting for me at the moment is doing that. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, I forget. I keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Ash. I just um, can concentrate on this record and um, <coughs> hopefully, you know, we get a... Um, you know, smash hit number one <laughs> out of it. And uh, we can, you know, play for a few more years at least. It, it just doesn't feel like we're nearing the, you know, the end of the road at all. So, I mean, I, I would like to think that we we have enough perspective on ourselves to kind of go, you know what, boys, we're getting a little long in the tooth and it's uh, not, not quite cutting it on stage anymore. It just doesn't feel like that at all. So, and especially now because we're not living in each other's pockets we all live in different areas it's like when we come together and play a show we really mean it so i can't think any further than that really andy i mean yeah i'm, I'm just looking forward to going out on tour again and doing it all again someone said oh, I, I read it or i heard it I, I can't remember but the quote was um the good old days are now like we're, we're creating them right now so i think i'm, I'm just going to take that and adopt it and um and try and enjoy every moment because like Chris said we, we treat every show like it could be our last and it, it bloody well could be so you just <laughs> you know we're going to go out tomorrow and kick ass and we'll do it again next time we play but yeah I'm just going to try and enjoy it because I'd hate to think it was our last show but it may be one day so we've got yeah hopefully a new record and that means a good couple of years on the road and um, I'm just going to enjoy every every gig that we have. It feels like, you know, what, you know what it feels like, Asher? Do you know what it feels like? It feels like the pressure's kind of off now. And I remember, like, you, like, talking like 99, sort of to 2005 or something. It just felt, maybe it was just me, but it just felt like there was this enormous pressure all the time. Having was to that deliver. when you got shingles? Huh? Was that when you got shingles or whatever you got? Like, <laughs> yeah, that was Freaking it. out in the corner? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah. But um, there's... there's <laughs> you did. I did, I did, I did. It was probably your fault. <laughs> um, there, there was, there is just feels like there's less pressure now, and I, I feel like we've we've gone through everything that a band can kind of go through. You know, we've dealt with some shit, bro, um, <laughs> and we've managed to survive it somehow. When a lot of bands have sort of crashed and burned, I think we're at the point now where we're sort of old enough and mature enough to be thankful of probably what we have, and we we're not ready to sort of you know let it go at this point. So. But we drink just as much as we ever did, but we just don't have as many problems. It's amazing. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming, and I just want to leave you with one thought that I strongly believe that now is the, the easiest time that it's ever been for a band to be competent and the hardest time that it's ever been for a band to be remarkable, and I just want to thank The Living End for being fucking remarkable. Thank you.